Story seven, new communities. Runcorn was the first of the towns of Holton to develop industry with the soap factories being built near the Bridgewater Canal, but it managed to keep its reputation as a resort. But over the river in Widnes, still a rural backwater till 1847, when John Hutchinson, aged 22, arrived and set up his factory. He set up his factory using the LeBlanc process to make alkali because he realised it was a good location. The raw materials were to hand. He could get coal down the Sankey Canal and it would be brilliant for a way of getting the soda ash that he was planning to make to people who need it. Now, in the UK, there's a census every 10 years. There's going to be one in 2021. That's to find out data about who we are and what we do. And in 1811, the census showed that there were about a thousand people in witness with Appleton. Moving on to 1851, there were about 5,000 people. In 1861, it had become 9,000. And in 1890, 33,000. So the population was booming. Maybe the class could tell that story with a bar chart made with bars of chocolate or Lego bricks or books or something. But where were these people coming from? Jean Morris said, the increased population was mainly unskilled immigrant labour a large proportion being Irish. Later on, there were people from other countries like Lithuania and Poland and other parts of the British Isles. Now, the local newspapers reported letters of complaint and consternation. And there were even comments in uh, letters to the council and parliament saying that the working people were concerned that their jobs were being taken by pauper immigrants. Investigations actually found that that wasn't true, what Jean Morris says, that the population who was already there, they stuck to the trades that they had. And these people who arrived were taking jobs in the new factory. In 1847, when John Hutchinson arrived, Ireland was in the middle of a dreadful potato famine because a fungus had destroyed the potato crop. People were starving, absolutely destitute, and a lot left to go to the United States. Well, they didn't actually get to the United States. They couldn't afford it. A lot of them arrived in Liverpool. People arrived in Widnes from there. They'd given up hope of going on to the United States. They couldn't afford it. They were destitute. They needed food. Liverpool was full of starving people and the people walked on to Widnes because they'd heard of the need for workers in these new factories. They found that there often was work, but it was really hard. They faced prejudice from people outside their own communities because they were seen as keeping wages low, but they were desperate for work. Before the potato famine, when the crop was good, they probably led healthy lives. And now here they were in the smoke of an industrial town. Strong communities of Irish people were built, often centred around the Catholic Church, with a priest as an influential member of the community, helping to build the schools and support the destitute. And it's said that there were actually more people of Irish uh, descent in Widnes than any other town of its size in England. And of note of one of the people born in Ireland is Dr John O'Keefe, who campaigned for better conditions, for a reduction in the pollution that was poisoning the workers, the rotten egg stink was from hydrogen sulfide, a toxic gas given off by the Galligan. He was a leading person in witness. He served on the local board of health, on the school board, the library, the technical institute committee, and really importantly, he was the medical officer for health. And he was really, really caring, despite his own life having been very hard. He served the town with dedication and he said, I don't care whether I'm a solitary individual or not. I'll always do what I can for the benefit of witness. People came from Lithuania and Poland. 
They were escaping hardship under Russian rule. Jean Morris says of them, most of these migrants had endured evil beyond description in their homeland. They'd undergone a brutal campaign to destroy their national identity and their religion. Now, lots of the people who arrived were from Lithuania, but when they arrived, well, they were described as Russians, which is a bit ironic because they were escaping the Russians. Um, because the Tsarist regime had uh, tried to destroy their language too. The people often had had a hard journey by land and ship crossing borders illegally. And industries in Widnes, just like the ones in Scotland, were short of workers who worked for low wages. And the people were attracted by the work that was available in the chemical factories. There were Lithuanian shops and bakers in West Bank, and the people would have bright ceremonial dress sometimes. During the 1930s, the area where a lot of the people lived was demolished and the community by then was the grandchildren of the people who'd arrived and they settled in other places in the area. And it's hard to tell whether somebody has ancestors who were Lithuanians and Poles because when people arrived, their surnames got turned to an English equivalent. But it's believed that lots of people in the area, if they have a look, they'll find that there's Europe. Eastern European heritage just somewhere in their family. By 1860, there was also a really strong wealth community in Widnes, people coming for work, and there were mostly people from rural North Wales who were quite poor at home. There were so many Welsh people arriving that there were three Welsh chapels, each serving, holding services in the Welsh language. There was a Welsh builder who built streets like Rill Street and Ellis Streets. There were Welsh people throughout Welsh Bank, so many that there was an annual, annual Eisteddfod. And Eisteddfod's a celebration of Welsh song, music, poetry. And Widnes for several years had its own. And it became so important in the life of the town that the schools were given a half day holiday so that the children could go. Now, Welsh isn't herding with us anymore, but if you just look at the surnames of people, a lot of Welsh surnames will show up, showing a lasting influence of ancestors from Wales. So 150 years ago, the town was a melting pot of everybody's ancestors who were not always treated well. It would have been a mixture of voices, of clothes, of different types of foods. The people coming in would have been struck by the grey blackness, as Jean Morris says, by the grey black smoke belching out from the huge factory chimney stacks into the dark skies and the absence of green space as the land where spring never came. And pause to think about those people coming to a new, very strange town, leaving behind fields and fresh air, Britain by poverty. The hardest job in the chemical industry was probably a bleach packer. There's more details of him with the story 10 about soap. And the Royal Commission on Labour in 1892 heard about the conditions in the chemical trades. The people who pack, worked in the bleach uh, factory packing it wore flannel muzzles over their mouths. This is an image from the Birth of an Industry Gallery in Catalyst, where there's a mock-up of him. So he's got his muzzle over his mouth. He's got effectively bandages round his arms and his legs to protect him from the harsh bleach and stop him being gassed. And the work had really nasty effect on the health of people. Although some of the families, were, the factories were run by unscrupulous employees who exploited their workers, others were compassionate and keen to see that the people who worked for them were not exploited. And that the people worked in towns with good transport and opportunities, schools, sports, social activities, and an annual holiday, maybe just a day, maybe longer, to somewhere in the country or by the sea. So, what about looking to the future? Who are the Widnesians making a difference now? Who are the people really standing up for Widnes, doing their best for others, locally, globally, whatever? 
There's a lot of diversity in the heritage of the term. Can you tell some of the stories of that? And of diversity in STEM, the diversity now that there is of the people who work as scientists and engineers. We've put a link in the teachers pack to a short video from the Royal Society where some people working in STEM tell the stories of the backgrounds that they've come from. People who are professional scientists and engineers, how have they got there? What can we learn from them?